Well, good morning. <clears throat> if you would uh, turn in your Bible to the book of Exodus, chapter 33. <clears throat> this morning we are going to be in verses 7 to 13. And uh, <clears throat> kind of going off the theme of last week where we looked at desperate for God's presence and how Moses was desperate for God's presence. Uh, this morning we are going to look at Moses who is desperate to know God. And next week uh, we are going to look at Moses who is desperate for God's glory. Um, so kind of a three-part series here. In Exodus chapter 33. So Exodus 33, uh, verse 7 to 13. Let's read the text, uh, open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into the, uh, the sermon this morning. Uh, beginning in <clears throat> verse 7. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out of the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out of the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you also have found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. <clears throat> Please pray with me. <clears throat> Father, we have gathered here this morning in hopes that we would know you, know you more deeply, uh, know you intimately, God, know you beyond just a, um, a service level, Lord, but that we would know your ways, we would know your heart, we would know who you are. Um, and so, God, we are asking right now that you would please make yourself known to us through your word, um, through my attempt to preach it, uh, and through our attempts to listen to your Holy Spirit this morning and to listen to each other. We, we desire to know you, God, as we have just sung. Um, it is our desire that, that we would know you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Moses has one prayer this morning. Please show me now your ways that I may know you. How do we know God? It's one of the most important questions that we can ask as Christians. It's the entire reason that the world exists. It's the entire reason that we were created, to know God. So how do we do that? It's an immense question that we're asking here this morning. I'm going to give us five means to know God, and these are by no means exhaustive. All right. Some of these are compared and some of them are contrasted uh, with Moses and the Israelites. Uh, so here are five means to know God. They're not going to be complicated. They're going to be simple. Uh, here they are. Number one, God's word. Uh, the other day I was surfing the web. I don't know if anybody still use that term anymore. I was surfing the web and I came across this picture. You'll be, see it up on the screen. I thought it was interesting. Complaining about a silent God while your Bible is closed is like complaining about not getting texts when your phone is turned off. I thought that was interesting. I was like, man, okay. Um, it's very true. I was reading an article from Religion News Services uh, in 2013. This is what the article uh, says. More than half of Americans think that the Bible has too little influence on a culture they see in moral decline, yet only one in five Americans read the Bible on a regular basis, according to a new survey. More than three quarters of Americans, 77%, think the nation's morality is headed downhill, according to a new survey from American Bible Society. The survey showed that the Bible is still firmly rooted in American soil. 88% of respondents said they own a Bible. 80% think the Bible is sacred. 61% wish they read the Bible more. And the average household has 4.4 Bibles. 
Doug Birdsall, president of American Bible Society, says he sees a reason for why the Bible isn't connecting with people. He writes, I see the problem as analogous to obesity in America. We have an awful lot of people who realize they're overweight, but they don't follow a diet, Birdsall said. People realize that the Bible has values that would help us in our spiritual health, but they don't read it. Isn't it interesting how we can look down upon a person who is overweight and maybe even pass judgment on them saying, why don't you just eat healthy? Why don't you just exercise? Surely we wouldn't want them looking at us saying, why don't you just read your Bible? If, it, if it's that easy, right? It's interesting how we don't want to pass judgment on somebody realizing, well, where could they pass judgment on me? Um, a poll by LifeWay Research in 2012 of over 2,000 Americans who read the Bible at least once a month found that only about one-third of them read it every single day, although the average owner reader owns 3.6 copies of God's Word, so somewhere between 3.6 and 4.4. What these surveys and polls reveal is that there is no correlation to people's access to the Bible and how much they actually read it. Now, why is this all important? Because we cannot know God apart from reading his word. We cannot know God apart from reading this. Yes, there are other ways to know God. There are. We're going to talk about some of those. Knowing God does not merely come from reading his word, but it also does not come void of reading his word. I want us to consider what an unbelievable privilege that we have, everyone in this room, and the fact that most of us have three, four, five copies of God's Word at home, in our home. I was counting mine. I have 17 copies of the Bible in my home. I don't say that to boast. I, I should give those away, right? And this does not include the endless access that we have to electronic means, I mean, we can download apps and Bible versions, and there are endless websites. We can even download apps that will read the Bible to us. And the electronic means that we have, it's really only been accessible in the past 10 to 15 years out of 10,000 years of history. And the written copy that we have right here, right, in this nice leatherly bound version, uh, uh, it's only been accessible to the public in the past 500 years out of 10,000 years of history. And even then, it wasn't until the 18th century or later that the average home even had their own copy of God's Word. Many people today still don't have access to God's Word. According to American Bible Society, most Americans, 72%, believe that the Bible is available in all languages. However, more than half of the world's 6,901 languages still do not have a completed Bible translation. 26% don't even have one started, and another 31% merely have one in progress. Now, why do I give you all of that information and all of those statistics? In the hopes that we would not take for granted that the God of the universe is but a bookshelf away or a coffee break away, or a bubble tea break away from us, or an app on your iPhone away. Knowing God really is right at our fingertips. It really is. You know, I, I was created to know God. That's why I exist. That's my whole reason of existence is to know God and to help others know God. That's why you exist. It's to know God and help others. And it really is right at our fingertips. These people, these Israelites in the story this morning, uh, they can't just go pick up the law and read it whenever they want. All the way through the New Testament, the early churches, they couldn't just go pick up a copy of Isaiah or Psalms and start reading it. Most synagogues, even in the New Testament, would only have one copy of God's Word, and even probably just part of it, and the commoner had to go and have it read to them because they couldn't read themselves or they couldn't have access to it. If you remember, Moses spends 40 days and 40 nights on top of the mountain to receive God's law. But then he has to communicate this law to the people. They don't each get their own copy of the Ten Commandments or the, the law. But, but we do. We get our own copy. 
God has made himself known to us through this. He has. And, and, and listen, here's the, the reality, all right? I, if we wrestle with reading this, and we all do, everybody in this room uh, uh, wrestles with reading this, including myself. Nobody reads this anywhere as much as we probably should, including myself. Um, the problem is not with our desire to read. The, the problem is not with the Bible. The problem is not that it feels antiquated. The problem is not that it's irrelevant. Uh, if we're honest, the problem is us, right? The problem is us because the truth is we'll read about whatever we prize. Whatever we prize, we will read about. Um, I'm really, I know this is going to sound strange, but I, I'm really, really looking forward to doing my taxes again. <laughs> Last year, I did my taxes for the first time ever. I did TurboTax. And uh, when I was doing it last year, it was like eating candy for me. Like, I loved it. I was reading tax article after tax article and like tax law after tax law. And, and I loved it. Why? Because I prized that refund. I prized not getting audited. I prized just the mere knowledge. I, don't, I should have been an accountant maybe, right? I prized just learning about that, the knowledge of it. Everybody loves to read about whatever we prize. And we all have an area like this, right? We all have at least one area like this. If you like football or playing fantasy football, we, we like reading. We'll, we'll read player stat after player stat, article after article. I've met some Christians who knew more about football than I would ever know about the Bible. And, and if you don't like football, you know, like, maybe that's not your thing. We all have an area like that. Maybe it's manga. Maybe it's comics. Maybe it's novels. Maybe it's vacation brochures. You know, whatever you prize, you love to read about. My point is that the problem is, is not that we don't like to read. That's not the problem. And the problem is not a discipline problem. We'll read about whatever we prize which then leaves us with the enormous question, do we prize knowing God? Do we prize knowing Him? Is God, the knowledge of God, knowing God, being intimate with God, a prize to us? And listen, I hope that you don't see this as simply like a, a spiritual discipline. It is a spiritual discipline, but it's so much more than that. I hope that we don't see it as this, like a checkbox, you know, something that you just do. Why? Because there's no merit in reading this in and of itself. Just to read it, to read it. There's no merit in that. Why do we read this? Because when I sit down with a cup of coffee and turn on the jazz playlist on Spotify and I start reading this, I actually get to know God, who he is, what he's like, what he cares about, what he values. I get to know God in that moment. That's why I, I read it. That's why you read it. God actually lets us know him through this. Two, prayer. Look at verse 8 uh, to 11. Whenever Moses went out of the tent, all the people would rise up, each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. The Lord would speak to Moses. And when the pillar of the cloud would be at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord would speak to Moses face to face. So I want you to catch this here. Catch the contrast. In verse 9, the Lord would speak to Moses, not the people. Verse 11, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face. Verse 12, it is Moses that God knows by name. Well, where are the people? The people have to stand at their own tent door. In verse 10, they have to worship at their own tent door. Moses and Moses alone is the one who gets to speak to God. Remember, Moses went up the mountain to speak to God. The people couldn't even touch the mountain, much less walk up it, much less actually hear from God. These were days that God only spoke to whomever he chose to speak to, period. And God only listened to those whom he chose to listen to. Moses has an unbelievable privilege of speaking to God face to face as a man speaks to his friend. 
He's the only one who has that privilege at this point in history. Now, guess who has that privilege now? Pastors. Only pastors. Not you guys. No. Every single Christian has now become Moses. Every single Christian now has the privilege of speaking to God the way Moses did. Face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Now, granted, we don't, I don't know if Moses audibly heard God, and if he did, we don't get to audibly hear God. Maybe you do. We don't get to visually see God. Maybe you do. But, we, you know, if Moses got these qualities, we don't. But we get to speak directly to God the way Moses did. Every Christian, if you are a Christian, you get to speak directly to God. Prayer is one of the primary means to know God. Now, just as a side note before we move on, um, I think it's fruitless to say, if you say, well, what's more important than knowing God, prayer or reading the Bible, right? That's a, that's a fruitless question. It's like saying, what's more important, uh, giving your child uh, water to drink or food to eat? Both. They'll die without both right? If prayer, and here's the question though, if prayer is primarily me talking to God, how exactly does prayer help me to know him? How does prayer help me to know God? Maybe you have felt before, and I know I felt this way, and so, and I know some of you have said this to me before, like when I pray, I don't hear anything. I don't, I don't feel anything. I don't feel like anything changes. I don't feel like anything happens. How does prayer help me to know God? Well, to answer this, I'd probably need to do an entire series on this, of how prayer helps us know God. So I'm just going to whittle this down to two elements, all right? Two elements. Number one, knowing God only comes through asking God to know him. Meaning that the only way we will know God and we will only know him to the degree that we ask him. This is what Moses does. Moses prays in verse 13. Look at it. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways. Why? That I may know you. This is what the psalmist prays. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. I mean, even though we have God's word, the whole thing, does anybody perfectly understand this? I mean, I know I do, but it's a joke. Does anybody perfectly understand this? Nobody under, perfectly understands this. We are so desperately dependent on God to make himself known to us, to explain this to us. God said that his ways are not our ways. His ways are so much higher than ours, that they're higher than the heavens, uh, are, than the earth. And that's how, how much higher he is. So listen, I'm never going to understand God unless I go to God and I say, will you please show me your ways that I may know you? That I go to him like the psalmist and say, make me know your ways, God, that I may know you. Listen, if, if you feel like you don't understand God, you know, you feel like, I don't understand God. If you say, I don't understand why God does what he does. I don't understand why God made me the way he made me. I don't understand why God wound up the world the way that he wound up the world. None of this world, myself, my friends, my life, make any sense to me. I don't understand that. One of the best places I would tell you to start is go to God in prayer and say, will you help me to understand this? Go to God and ask him to reveal himself to you. God will answer that prayer. If you ask God to make himself known to you, he will answer it every time. Now, you may not discern it, but he will answer that prayer every time. God wants us to know him, but he wants us to ask him to know him. He's not going to just open our brains and dump in knowledge. Prayer, the second reason, second element. How does prayer help us know God? Prayer conforms us to the character of God. How? How does prayer conform us to the character of God? Well, all of us have strengths and weaknesses, right? For example, 
I am very strong in empathy and compassion, and my wife is not. And so we have strengths and weaknesses. Some are strong in leadership and weak in humility. Some are uh, strong in humility, but weak in passion. We wrestle with different sins. And as Christians, we want to grow, right? If you're a Christian, you want to grow. We want to grow, and sometimes we're like, I don't know how to. I don't know how to. And so uh, we know that God is this, whatever this is. Maybe it's kind or compassionate or slow to anger or loving, patient, whatever. We know that God is this, and it's like, I don't know how to have that. How do I get this? Well, I would suggest to you to pray. Knowing God is not simply knowledge of God, but knowing his character, knowing his heart. When Moses prays, please show me your ways, I don't think he's praying, show me how to part a Red Sea. Show me how to give, like, show, like, show me how to give water from a rock. I don't think that's what he's praying. I think what he's praying is, God, would you show me why you do these things? God, Show me why are you compassionate towards these people? Show me why do you love us? Show me why are you patient with us? Would you show me why you are these things? God, I want to know you. I want to know your compassion, your patience, your love. When we pray, prayer has a way of conforming us to the character of God. Listen, I think if somebody were to ask me, how do I have a better spiritual walk, right? Like, um, I just feel like I don't know God, uh, and I want to know him, but I just don't know how to. Uh, what can I do? This is what I would tell them. Listen, it's not going to be complicated. It's not going to be complicated at all. Read your Bible every day and pray every day. Now, it's certainly way more than that. But you could start right there. God wrote you a a letter. Read it every day and talk to him every day. You can start right there. And before I move on to number three, um, let me just say, if you're wrestling with prayer, and again, just like reading God's word, we all wrestle with this. We all wrestle with finding the motivation to pray. If you're wrestling with this, I want to share with you an an interview uh, with Tim Keller. Tim Keller's a pastor in New York. Uh, that This interview was really, really helpful to me in learning to value prayer. This is what the interviewer uh, said. Last December on Twitter, you were asked, why do you think young Christian adults struggle most deeply with God as a personal reality in their lives? You replied, noise and distraction. It's easier to tweet than pray. Sadly true. And we are fickle people. For all the many benefits of the digital technology, we are tempted to get distracted from prayer by tweets and our Facebook feeds and texts and emails on our phone. In a sense, we want to be distracted. You've already identified this as a problem earlier. So what counsel would you give to a Christian who finds himself or herself lured to distractions when they are trying to pray? What counsel would you give, Pastor Tim? And he says, I mean, there is no way around just simply saying, this is something I must spend time doing. In the book, I tell the story of how my wife used an illustration on me. If the doctor said you had a fatal condition, and unless you take this medicine every night from 11 o'clock to 11.15, swallow these pills, you will be dead by morning. If that was the case, she said, you would never miss. You would never say I was too tired or I didn't get to it or I was watching a movie or I didn't leave time. You would never do that. And so when people ask, how am I going to get to prayer? How am I going to deal with distractions? I say, maybe you don't believe you need prayer. And that is a theological, spiritual problem. And there's nothing I can do except tell you to get your heart and your mind straight on that. Wow. Man, that hit me hard. That really convicted me. Maybe you don't believe you need prayer. Going to God in prayer is a lot like exercising. 
the longer you go without it, the harder it is to do it. But the more you do it, the more you develop a taste for it. And the more you desire it. The more we know God, the more we desire him. Knowledge of God leads to desire of God. Three, God's spirit. I want to read a later account of Moses. All right, so I'm going to jump text here for just a minute in Exodus uh, because I think this is, I'm going to tie it in. All right, follow along with me on the screen here. Numbers 11, 24 to 29. Uh, later in the, in the desert experience, Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. He gathered 70 men of the elders of the people, placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on 70 elders. As soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now, two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad, the other Medad, Eldad, Medad. All right. And the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran to tell Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them! But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on all of them. See, God did not pour out his spirit in those days. But Moses wished that God would. Well, Moses' wish has now come true. Acts 2, in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. All sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. In the Old Testament, the people were completely dependent on God to give his spirit. Some men, like Moses and David and Joshua, had the spirit of God in this fashion. Some had the spirit come upon them and then leave them. But most did not receive the spirit the way that we receive the spirit. Yet now, all Christians have been given the spirit of the living God inside of them. And you might say, how does this help us know God? How does that help me to know God? Again, I'd probably need to do a series on that. How does the Holy Spirit help us know God? But I'm going to boil it down to one element. We've talked about the knowledge of God, knowing God through head knowledge. We've talked about the heart of God, being conformed to his character. But what about the will of God? What does God want me to do? Knowing God is not merely knowledge of God or even knowing his character, but knowing what am I supposed to do with that? If there is one question that I think I've been asked more than any other question in this church in the past five years, it's this. What am I supposed to do? Do I go on this mission field? Do I, go, do I not go on this mission field? Do I date this person? Do I not date this person? Do I get baptized? Do I not get baptized? Do I take this job or do I take that job? Should I focus on this ministry? Should I focus on that ministry? Many times uh, when pastors are asked those questions, Christians want their pastor to be Moses and to give an answer like, Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt work at Microsoft, not Google. Most of the time, we want that answer because it's, it's easy. But I rarely give that answer, and the answer that I do give is often unsatisfactory. You have to be spirit-led. There's always this kind of, like, oh, look. What I get. <laughs> Listen to me. This is probably the most important point in the entire sermon. Knowing what to do in your life is probably 99% knowing God and 1% knowing yourself, the circumstances, the situation, the pros, the cons. How do I know what God wants me to do? The Holy Spirit. Jesus told us, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. The Spirit will help you know God, and knowing God will help you know his will. 
The ultimate goal in life is not to know God's will for your life. The ultimate goal is to know God. Know God and his will will follow. And listen, sometimes the Spirit convicts, right? Uh, you hear the Spirit kind of talking to you saying, Matt, go read your Bible. Uh, Matt, go pray. Matt, go give. Uh, Matt, go share the gospel. Matt, go and stop sinning in this way. And you're like, no, Spirit, I don't need conviction right now. I need an answer. And the Spirit is saying, I'm trying to give you an answer. No, go know God. And you'll get the answer. The goal is not for me to tell you what your purpose in life is. The goal is to know the Father. And the purpose will follow. Sometimes that's why we wrestle. We put the cart before the horse. Know God first. One of the greatest contrasts between how the Israelites were able to know God and how we are able to know God is the body of Christ. As we looked at earlier, only one man is going to meet with God. Only one man is receiving the law. Only one man got to speak to God and hear from God. Everyone else is standing at their own tent door, worshiping at their own tent door. But here's the beauty of the church. When we gather, it's no longer Matt meets with God. And I alone bring you a word from God. There's an element to that. And that pastors and teachers are called by God to uniquely meet with God, to teach God's people. However, when we gather, all of us are Christians who have the spirit of the living God inside of us. All of us have access to God's word. All of us have the capability of knowing God individually and then bringing that knowledge to the body of Christ. God speaks of this in Jeremiah 31. God says, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. God has now made himself known to all Christians, not just to a select few. This is why it should baffle us when people believe that they can have a walk with God apart from the body of Christ. It should really baffle us. Because here's what it would be like. Let me give you an illustration of what that would be like. Imagine if you found a puzzle piece. I meant to bring one of my boys' puzzle pieces for you uh, visual learners. Um, that's what Tim Shepard would tell me. Man, you gotta, you gotta reach the kinesthetic learners and the, the visual learners, you know? They're too auditory. Um, uh, Imagine if I found a puzzle piece, all right? And let's say I studied that puzzle piece and I knew everything there was to know about it. I knew every color on it, every groove, every fiber. I mean, I was an expert on this puzzle piece. There's nothing I don't know about it, right? And then one day, someone comes along. And you're like, hey, you have a puzzle piece too. Can, can I see that? You take it and you... I, I want to, how are they, you put them up and you're like, whoa! And the picture just got bigger. And you're like, what, this is not the picture. Like, I, I thought I had the picture. And it's only when you get the other puzzle piece that you realize the picture got clear and bigger. And then you begin to think, wait a minute, what if there are more puzzle pieces out there? I thought my piece was the picture. And now I'm seeing two pieces together. I see that there's a greater picture here. I only had a piece of the picture. And so now you go on this journey, desperate to find other pieces because you want to put it together. But there's only one way to find this final picture. You need other puzzle piece holders. See, in Exodus 33, Moses is the primary puzzle piece holder. Later, God will broaden this scope to teachers and the Levites and, and people who got to teach the people. But at Pentecost, God is going to rain down puzzle pieces to the church through his spirit. I want to encourage you that one of the ways that we get to know God 
is to get into each other's worlds. Ask questions, dialogue, confront, challenge, pray, encourage, prophesy, sharpen. And listen, this goes both ways. We need to be willing to share, and we need to be willing to receive others sharing. And listen, if, if you think that your neighbor can't teach you something, maybe you might think, I don't think you can teach me something, Matt. If you think that you can't be taught by the person sitting next to you, C.S. Lewis wrote, next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. The holiest thing you will ever come across in your senses is your neighbor. It's the only thing that has the Spirit of God inside them. One of the reasons that I went into ministry is because I love the church. I love Bible studies. I love Sunday school. I love preaching. I love prayer group. I love the retreat and fireside chats and conversations at Denny's at 2 a.m. Those are my favorite. I know Frank does. And, and, and I love those. Ultimately, hear me out, ultimately, not because you're so awesome. I don't love those ultimately because you're so awesome. But because I love God. And you have God inside you. I love the God that is inside you. I love how God has revealed himself to you and not to me. You have a peace of God that I don't have. And I love learning about that. I think that I've learned as much about God from other people than I have any source in my life. That's why I went into ministry. We have the same God inside of us, but God has revealed himself in different ways to you than me. And God has revealed himself to me in different ways than you. And I yearn to know those ways in you. That's what causes me to come here every Sunday and every Friday and every prayer group and every small group. And it's not to get a paycheck. I, I, don't, I don't care about the paycheck. I need it, but I don't care about it. I come because I yearn to see what picture of God do you paint? We can help each other know God. And then five, last point, God's Son. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. Is there any way that we know God better than His Son? And let me make this point. Imagine if there was a girl that I wanted to marry. Imagine if I was a single guy and there was a girl I wanted to marry, and I met her online. There's absolutely nothing wrong with meeting people online. All right, let me say that. It's, it's perfectly acceptable. No shame. I know many godly people who are now married have three kids and met their spouse online. Okay? Let me just say that, put that out there. Imagine if I met a girl. I didn't meet Lauren online, by the way. Um, <laughs> you can see I'm still a little ashamed of it. Imagine I met a girl online, and after meeting her, she says she wants me to know her, so she sends me her diary. She actually sends me every diary she's ever written since she was 13 years old. And she's like, I want you to know who I am. So I get all these diaries in the mail, and I would read every single page, right? I would study it, because I'd want, it, it, it's a window, it's a gift into who she is. I get to find out her deepest thoughts and feelings and, and things that like no guy ever gets to know, right? I would want to know her. I would want to know if I could trust her. Is this somebody I could trust? Is this somebody that I even desire? Suppose I could even Skype her. I could talk to her whenever I wanted, right? Pull her up on Skype. I can talk to her. She can talk to me. She can tell me about her day. I can tell her about mine. Suppose she even sent her best friend to me who would come and hang out with me. 
This best friend knows her better than anybody in the world. She keeps me making bad decisions. She's like, "Uh uh-uh, not plaid. Don't be buying her plaid pants. I'm like, oh, okay. Bad decision. Thanks, best friend. Suppose she even sent her family to come and live with me. And these are people who love her and care for her and have the same mutual interest, right? We all have the same common interest. And as great as all of that would be, diaries, Skype, a best friend and family, I would still want to meet her. I would still want to see her in the flesh and live with her and talk with her in the flesh. Even though I know it would be difficult, it would require sacrifice and love and an element of suffering. Anybody who's in a relationship knows that. But I would still want that because nothing could compare with that. I think perhaps the greatest way that we know God is Jesus, God in the flesh. God gave us a gift in Jesus, a window into the heart of God like never before. You might say, well then, okay, how do I know Jesus? Well, yes, we can do the things we've already talked about and we need to do those things, but perhaps we want to know, how do I actually know him? How do I actually have fellowship with Jesus? How do I actually have intimacy with Jesus? How do I do that? Well, Paul gives us a means that he never really strays from in his writings. You see, it would be easy to have a relationship or a marriage through reading a diary, through Skyping, through hanging out with a best friend, sharing a meal with the family. Those things would be easy, in a sense. But to truly know her, to truly know her, I have to get down in the trenches and live the same life that she is living. I got to live the same life she's living. That's the only way I would truly, truly know her. How do I know Jesus? How do I have fellowship with Jesus? Paul says that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Knowing Jesus is the most direct and clear path to knowing God. And to know Jesus, to have intimacy with him, we have to live the same life that he lived. It's the only way we know him. It's the only way we have fellowship with him. God's desire is that we would know him. That's why he created us. That's why we exist. That's why he gave us Jesus. I pray that we would know God through his word, through prayer, through the spirit, through the body of Christ, and through his son Jesus.